Cool. Welcome to Half Past Capitalism. Um, I'm here with uh, Lauren Hudson, who is a um, creator of Alternatives to Capitalism, a uh, researcher of um, movement activities. Uh, and I'll get into a little more detail about what Lauren's up to. But first, I want to say hi. Hi. Hello. Didn't know if there's a hi to me or a hi to all of everyone. Hello. <laughs> Definitely hi to you and, and everyone else. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to start by asking, um, I guess, just to sort of ground ourselves in the sort of everyday lived experience, uh, what is your uh, most recent and notable uh, experience of capitalism? Like what, what, what was something that happened in your life that, that sort of made you think this is happening? Uh, I'd say, well, you know, capitalism and a crisis, and and it being a crisis is ongoing. Um, so I think these last few, like really, this last week, I uh, started teaching. And while I teach at a public university, I teach in the CUNY system, so the University of New York. The it's actually the culture, right? That makes me think of like my most recent experience with capitalism. So the feelings of like not being productive or hyper productivity, the strains that instructors are under to shift courses on a dime, not just obviously uh, higher ed instructors, we have a little bit easier than our friends doing um, high school and teaching little ones. But the grind of doing that and managing a living in a public health crisis <laughs> would be my most ex my most recent experience is feeling like as soon as I get news about my family's health or my friend's health my attention shifts to okay this is how I have to readjust my teaching schedule or like make sure that I'm still creating the same output and maybe carve out a little bit of space to deal with this interpersonally and personally so the the sequestering of the well, our own like emotional well being into these tight little boxes. Um, I'd say, generally speaking, from 2020 to 2021, but also feeling it very acutely this week as the new semester starts. Fair enough. And, and like, what would you say, like, what is sort of particularly capitalistic about that, about that sort of grind? Oh, well, the feeling that you're the, the top of the line thing that matters is production. Right, mm -hmm. so no, it's not necessarily like the legit, I don't know, like exploitation of my surplus value that I'm feeling. It is the the emotional and cultural drive to continue to produce at the same rate, if not a higher rate, when you're experiencing an unprecedented event personally and generally. So there's sort of cult, like a cultural values and forms that have been created by that, by the general need for profit, but 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 you're more feeling the the like the cultural end. Mm, than the absolutely. than the sort of economic end. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And is that is that sort of like it, it? Does that kind of show up in 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 relation to other people, or is it um, is it more like just something you feel inside your, yourself, or? Uh, it's both, right? And the relation to other people would probably be the relation the the responsibility that we feel that we have to our students because we are the people that they interface with the most, and so. It's just right. really under discussed, as is most things, um, the amount of emotional energy that instructors put in in March and April to be able to pivot so fast and then to also, you know, be the people that students reach out to and talk to regardless of whether we put ourselves in that role or not it's still us they're less likely to go to like the chair or the dean or something like that and yeah um so yeah it's interpersonal between that and then it's obviously the guilt that you carry with you that you could have done more haven't done enough or the really like galaxy brain kind of guilt and shame about feeling guilty about not putting up boundaries <laughs> right? right um because it's like, well, ideally, wouldn't we want to be this kind of like have this emotional availability to these people that we care about? And we would if that was compensated and we weren't adjuncts and we weren't, you know, the flexible labor class that we are. 
So it sounds like there's a big unpaid care work sort of element. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's a way that that is then, I don't know, kind of marketized as we've, I'm trying to pay attention to the language of these like calls for um, filling teachers positions and how you have to sell yourself as someone who's like, now I can teach secret synchronously and asynchronously. And I have like all the zoom experience and like, it's, I, when my, my actual impulse is to be like, no, I want to make it my, less easy. <laughs> um, I don't want to encourage this like further trend of being like flexible and precarious, you know, I want to actually be like less flexible and, that's not the way that labor has been moving, um, unfortunately, because, and we knew that this wave was coming, but we expected it to be a little bit more progressive and it's become very, very cute. Like we can name it March 13th, 2020, New York City. Um, right. I mean, it sounds like there's also sort of a divergence between what you understand to be the public good and your own, and your own personal good and mm -hmm. all the things that you're supposed to do to be successful. Right, and it needn't be that way at all. If we had been, it's, I just, <laughs> if our structures had operated better, we wouldn't feel this need to like keep things as consistent as possible over time. We could have had a come to Jesus and said, you know what, this year is a wash. Everyone like don't teach the same amount of hours. And we could have made that an institutional policy and we didn't. What we did was like, it operates kind of as a whisper network among people who aren't paid enough. Yeah. Like, listen, this is how you survive this. And this is what you communicate to your students about surviving it. But if that was happening at the departmental level or the like, just the CUNY wide level, that's like, hey, we're, we're moving things online, yes. And it's going to look completely differently to adjust to people's lives, but they chose not to. And I mean, it seems like in, in, in COVID, there's, uh, you know, in COVID times, there's a, a, a kind of a structural economic level drive to like keep things going mm -hmm. that sort of is cascading down, <laughs> like, yes. all, you know, from, um, you know, from the, the heights of industry and commerce to, you know, the governor to, the university system to your department to you like mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that how you would sort of see it or or do you think that there's a a place where you could sort of i don't know put a put a plug in the dam and be like all right we, we're going to create a we're going to create a, <laughs> a a better space here yeah i mean we know that when the federal state and local level governance abandons its social welfare role that the risks and negative impacts of those choices fall on like the individual the individuals like households and the people working within them um and it can feel hard because it wedges you into a role of like all you can do is consume differently or you know plug, as you said, like plug holes <laughs> and paper over cracks. The long-term impacts of that is that you've communicated to the city, the state and the federal government that you are able to do that and that working conditions can be as bad or worse in the future out of crisis and you would still be able to work under them. So the, the way that you counter that is you have a massive general strike. <laughs> no, anything short of that, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously like reacting out of like a really acute stress right now, but, um, but anything other than that isn't our, our, us continuing to work at any level of productivity right now, what does that communicate in the long term? Oh, we can really drive these people to the grindstone. We can make it so that upwards of 30,000 people in New York can die of a pandemic and people will still show up to do it. Uh, yeah, it's bad. It's, it's bad. wild. It's absolutely <laughs> wild. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the same thing almost everywhere, it seems like. Um, yeah, so so thanks for sort of indulging that that mm -hmm. sort of flight into your lived experience of capitalism. I feel like it's, it's nice, like, these things can get really abstract. So it's sort of an experiment in terms of like grounding, um, grounding the conversation and kind of where you're coming from. Um, but but sort of, I think it, it leads pretty directly into what I understand your work to be, um, which is which is sort of researching um, from a feminist perspective, um, kind of how to create those spaces that are 
that are not subject to capitalist logic and in, in to whatever extent, uh, and also in building the sort of solidarity economy in NYC. Um, so I wanted to start with the, the sort of second piece. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your work with um, Solidarity NYC and sort of how that led to uh, the creation of, of Scenic and, and what those two things are? Sure. So Solidarity NYC is a Solidarity Economy Organizing and Research Collective. It predates me. I came in in around 2012. Um, and the interest was we were seeing a lot of collective work in the city operating in silos, right? So we were seeing community gardens and food cooperatives, worker co-ops, housing co-ops, which have a very deep and cool history in our city. And they all needed resources or they all had shared or similar visions of what work and what life can look like. Um, and they all had direct, obviously, experience um, sharing risks and resources with one another, but we didn't see a lot of crosstalk. So we did several different ethnographic projects from that desire. One was just mapping what the work was in the city that we knew. And that still like lives on our site and people submit sites that they know we had a, a kind of pseudo vetting process for it. Um, but the first thing is to make it visible and to make it visible in space. And it's actually part of a longer organizing tradition that we see in SE work around the world too. You'll always see a map. Um, so we did that. And then after that, we we're like, okay, well, what, who are these people? <laughs> Many of them are our friends, uh, reaching out to them and doing a, uh, just interviews about like, why do you do this work? What do you need? Where do you see this work going? And from that, pulling the common threads of what needs were and hosting a lot of like report backs around those different needs. And so that became a scaffolding for the Cooperative Economic Alliance of New York City, which we now have, which is a cross sectoral membership network at the citywide level where people can share resources, where people can like learn together because there's not a lot of I, well, I won't make too much of a broad branch statement about that, but we, especially when we're talking about like, say like cooperative businesses, you have to learn how to like run a business and be a co-op, right? And so you have to learn the, like the cultural twitches of working collectively, which go really, really under-resourced and really under-emphasized. Um, and you have to learn how to like do your books and all these other like material, other material things. And we see those things as like very, very equally important and building trust is very, very important to creating sustainable collective lives. So Scenic really emphasizes that as well. We have our cooperative leadership intensive, we do board trainings, we do Solidarity Economy 101 because we have those other sectoral networks in our city, like let's say the New York City network of worker co-ops that are very, very good at training people about like how to run a business and doing that other stuff. Um, so yeah, Scenic is the place where you kind of combine those skills and also learn from people that are doing collective work in a thing that you probably have no experience in either and combining that knowledge together. So, okay, so that's that's a that's a huge, huge amount of arc. Um, and I, I gather that it's been, you know, at, uh, at least a decade uh, that, so so just to, to recap from just so, so I can, I can understand and viewers can understand is like you started with a, a, a small sort of grassroots group of volunteer based people called Solidarity NYC and then you were like okay how do we build a solidarity economy in, in New York City. And then you, mm -hmm. you mapped out all the different actors and then you surveyed them and got their perspective. And then you turn, and then from that, you, you created a new organization that sort of what's called Scenic, C-A-N-Y-C, um, which basically groups all those people together and, and has all kinds of training and, and, and peer support and mutual aid, which mm -hmm. then um, feeds into like the sort of multifaceted, um, skills that you need to build a solidarity economy, which as you said, sort of include uh, sort of everything from like the super logistical accounting to like how to be in a collective, how to like, you know, um, wrap your brain around the like completely transforming the economy. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, exactly. that's well, first of all, that's amazing. Um, it's <laughs> an incredible project. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, I'd, um, how how is it going? Like how how do you feel at this at this moment in? Uh... Oh, how is it going? It's about 
doing okay. I mean, the the hurdles that we come up with are the hurdles you would imagine. Um, money, time, um, the kind of intangibleness of creating a collective consciousness, <laughs> you know, and uh, you, we often say, not we in Scenic, but we, the royal we, about how, you know, crises are also generative. So the landscape of the work, I mean, I'm a peer educator. So the stuff that I do is really facilitation and like holding the space for the conversation. So I'm not at like a board level or a staff level here, but the trying to keep a perspective as to how our landscape has shifted in the last year when so much of our survival depends on collaboration and so many other generative projects have come out of it in order to fill those gaps. And at the same time, we need the, the SE entities that are businesses, we need them to function and they're being hard hit as well, right? So they're facing the same things that other, let's say commercial spaces in the city are facing. And there's some nimbleness there because they're in a, uh, you know, they're in a shared landscape of collective work that they can lean on, but that still doesn't mean that the suffering is gone because they're in a co-op, it's not. Um, so yeah, it's going okay, as well as things can go, <laughs> like, um, you know, kind of adjusting the grading on a curve since last March, it's going okay, I'd say. And we are seeing examples of like cross-sectoral collaboration here, food distribution and community gardens, for example. Um, it's like, especially in the food sector, because that was one of the first things that we saw really come under all these stressors during the pandemic and people's access to food became much more dire than other access needs. And have you seen any particularly successful models or kind of ways of, of doing the cross-sectoral? I mean, in food in particular, I'd be curious. Mm -hmm. So here in central Brooklyn, we have one of our, like not our scenic, but in central Brooklyn's, one of its anchor organizing institutions would um, be the Brooklyn Movement Center. And their project, on, which has been ongoing for years, has been to develop the central Brooklyn food co-op. And I really, really admire the their organizing work and their perspective on their organizing work of like, we need to build a base of consciousness at the same time that we're building any kind of brick and mortar space that provide needs. So people are primed to be in the kind of collective relationship with one another. And so when the pandemic hit, they were doing a lot of surveying of the members of Brooklyn Movement Center, but also residents of uh, North Crown Heights and Bed-Stuy, like, what are your needs? What are the things you like to eat? What are like, how can you imagine your participation in this thing moving forward? And because they had done that and built that trust, they were able to respond with, um, with like different mutual aid and, and rapid response food strategies there. And were able to bring in um, Brooklyn Packers, which is a worker co-op that does like distribution and supplying too. So wow. right now you have a group of people that are familiar to one another that can coordinate and do the rapid response um, food stuff at the same time that you're building a base of people to be in a collective institution in the future, either maybe through the worker co-op path or maybe through the food co-op or some combination of both. And so what are the needs that are being sort of met through through these act activities? I mean, I'm assuming it has to do with food distribution, but 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 is it is it um, sort of food bank stuff or is it um, is it just access to, to healthy food or like what? Yeah. Tell me yeah, it's access that. because I mean, I'm not a worker owner at Brooklyn Packers, but they act there. Um, they have food from one of their providers is uh, Lancaster, which is in Pennsylvania um, in the co-op and essentially running a CSA program out of that, but making sure that it like people of all kind of like class backgrounds can access that as well. So yeah, in the in the very rote function, sure, you can think of it as like a food bank because it's like getting food out to people um, with no like ask. Um, but it's also the value change that we love to talk about, right? So we have this worker co-op in central Brooklyn that's also connected to this long-term organizing institution that's incubating a food cooperative. And then the worker co-op is also getting um, some if not most of its food supply from a producer cooperative in our larger food shed. 
So it sounds like you're really, I mean, in some ways that's like a micro, like sort of living the dream in some ways in, in just in terms of like having points at all points of like the value chain be cooperating as opposed to competing or trying to mark up prices or gouge or, right. or, um, or, or offload externalities or whatever. Right. Right. Exactly. And, you know, as a geographer, I just like salivate at any kind of space making. Um, so I don't want to, again, I'm not, I'm not a worker owner there. So I can't speak too much to like the affective qualities of this, sure. but my interest, let's say in the long term, is like the actual kind of social cohesion that is built through collective work and how that applies to like how we see ourselves in our neighborhoods, especially when there's so many externalities that push us out of our neighborhoods, rising rents. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the, the main one, like our housing precarity here. So how are we building nets to like keep us in place, especially yeah. in a particular health crisis where you have to be in place? Um, yeah, so those, that's the kind of thing I'm turning my eyes to the next year. Well, um, and, and there's, I mean, I think the, the, the food co-op that people are more likely probably to have heard of in Brooklyn is the Park Slope Food Co-op um, in terms of the contrast between the, the sort of nascent central Brooklyn food co-op and the Park Slope Food Co-op. Would you, would, you, would you sort of notice any contrasts there in terms of response to the crisis or, or just general approaches like that you'd wanna highlight? Sure. So we're talking about a massive dif like difference in scale, right? So Park Slope is the largest consumer food co-op that we have in the States with upwards of 17,000 to 20,000 members on any given time, but they are not doing rapid response food work. So I know. <laughs> so, and there are their own, like, uh, let's say like technical reasons that they, that they don't, um, everything from like a limited shop floor size to we can't do this without member labor. We can't have member labor because of the early lockdown ordinances. Um, they're now phasing in member labor, but they're under kind of a financial crisis in, that was like off and on for a while because they then had to hire more staff, right? Because this is a fun quirk of collective work. We, when you co-own an institution or co-manage an institution, you're not a worker per se, um, or you're not solely a worker. And so the lines of essential, non-essential labor get really blurry in those circumstances. And that's right. because we don't have a lot of cooperative examples in New York relative to maybe other regions around the world to build out like a better legal structure and or interest in building a better legal, legal structure for that kind of labor. So yeah, the way that Park Slope was responded, if you walk in, the space is very much redesigned to ensure distance. They have like um, particular hours for immunocompromised people to shop. You still have to wait online outside um, because they're managing how many people can be inside this space. So they're doing all of that, uh, the phased in like sanitation of everything every so often you'll hear over the PA system for those that are working like, okay, it's time to sanitize. So part of that is fine. Part of that is COVID theater, knowing that we're talking about uh, something that transmits like because you're talking, right? And so distance is very important. Um, yeah, so it's interesting though, that you have something that is the scale of tens of thousands of people, yet there's no organizing impulse to make sure that those people who are truly homebound or don't wanna wait outside or don't wanna be inside of a store for any other reason, um, it doesn't even mean to, it doesn't even need to be that you're immunocompromised. It could be that you're just more wary that there's no way to mobilize or no effort to mobilize those tens of thousands of people to then just like get that resource out, right? So- And it sounds like it's a combination of both. It's like there is, you know, it's partially that there's no way, but it's also partially that there's no impulse. Right, I mean, if imagine if we had framed that in, prioritize that in the beginning, right? And said, the most important thing is that every single member has, is fed equally and like that's the way that we guide through it seems like the most important thing in this case is like so that is that we maintain access to the space to get food and we maintain access as best as possible but you're always going to have people that can't come out of that right um 
you know, when there's a threat of being ill. So I know that they had partnered with this group, I think it's called like Invisible Hands or something, essentially a, a nonprofit that has existed prior to the pandemic that would like, you would contact someone, they would essentially like do a task for you, kind of like a better, softer task rabbit kind of thing. So the, the way around um, you going shopping or the way around Park Slope as an institution to take responsibility is for them to like offload that collectiveness to another group. And it's just so weird because you have a, you again, have a shared membership of tens of thousands of people. You could, right. I don't know, map where those addresses are on the back end and sort pods and put people in contact with one another and make sure that they take care of one another. But it's not, a, I feel like at a certain scale, uh, and I feel like you would have far better experiences than I would, because we don't have many scales to speak of in cooperative work in the States. Um, so at, at what, is there a certain scale where the, the solidarity kind of taps out and you're more engaged as like a consumer of a thing right. with, with a kind yeah, of that, price break? That's than always you are. the challenge, yeah. yeah. Right, and so I feel like many of us like this, the soft and fuzzy edges around Park Slope and like those are like cherries on top of a thing versus my perspective to collective work is like, that's actually the thrust of the thing because that ensures that it's here for longer right. and it's actually penetrates, I don't know, deeper. Um, and it sounds like the sense. contrast with the central Brooklyn food co-op is that it's it's a it's a it's still in a startup phase, and so it's able to um, well a be a lot more nimble and but also a lot more relational because it's thinking about it's it's conceptualizing like what it, it's supposed to be doing um, and and probably maybe there's a, some difference in values as well. Perhaps, and I don't want to get in That's these streets about like <laughs> parks versus central park. They might not even see each other in opposition. I don't know their relationship to one another too deeply, but no, no. Uh, it's, I mean, it's more about the, the contrast or like the the yeah. way, a way of understanding both better by understanding why the, how they're different. Not, not to say that they're in competition at all. Right, right. Yeah, it is building relationally, and this is the this is kind of like the first to my, my own personal experience for food club that I've like been paying attention to like how they're how they're building from the beginning and growing and all these other right, things and obviously right. was not here in 1973 when Park Slope was doing it I don't know how they built community in that neighborhood or how they organized it to I don't know and how that if at all contributes to where they are now 45 years later either but for now it seems like it is not necessarily building relationally, even though its doors have been open the entire time. Right. Um, so I also want to talk about a little bit about your your sort of research. Um, can you can you talk about yeah, like what 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 are your findings? <laughs> <laughs> what did I find about collective work in the city? Yeah. So my research started. Um, it's ob obviously things evolve, and it started from this premise of, you know, seeing a lot of women do collective work and having it be a rule of thumb that women did a majority of collective work in our city. And I wanted to get more into those gender dynamics. And also at the time that I was entering my program was around 2014 when worker co-ops as a sector had gotten, you know, a million dollars to do technical assistance and other kind of co-op development stuff. And this actually loops back to like how we know each other because right around then, um, Solidarity NYC have gone to Montreal and we'd spoken with you, Drew, and I remember you kind of gave us this warning, like the neoliberalization of cooperation, you know, you get the capital that you might need, but then it's all about where does that capital go? Does it go to get you out of debt? Does it go to technical assistance? Where does it go? And also, does it, uh, does it actually like, impede our ability to make more radical demands about like labor and collectivity long-term um, because it's then harder, maybe, let's say we have like a beautiful <laughs> built out, you know, cooperative and collective system in New York City, does it then, I don't know, reduce the impulse to make more critical and radical demands too. And so you're like, this all seems good now, but <laughs> wait for like, how does it build consensus and what does it build consensus around? Um, so those are the two things I had in mind. And 
my work started by doing ethnographies of women doing collective work in different sectors, community gardens, food co-ops, worker co-ops, but also collective housing, like whether it's cooperative, formal cooperative housing or like living collectively as well because a lot of the research that was coming out around 2014 was a lot of proof of concept kind of work. Like, see, we're doing things. And, and that was at all scales from like the development sector to like organizers themselves. We're so desperate to prove that thing existed. Solidarity might see included in many ways. Um, but there wasn't a lot from the practitioner level about like how they actually saw the, the, uh, the contours of their own organizing. There was nothing about like, there was nothing spatializing it. And since I've always been trained as a geographer and also knowing that our organizing tradition has been to map things, I was like, actually there's not a spatial discipline for how we understand collective work, at least in the solidarity economy literature to my, and to the, and it gets more narrow because North American solidarity economy literature is a lot newer and a lot more like functions a lot differently than it does in like Latin America or even Western Europe or in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So, and, yeah. And what would you say is distinctive about about the North American or or even New York City mm, solid economy organizing? Well, I would say that it focuses a lot on the economy and not a lot on the solidarity part of it. Um, which isn't like bad, but it's like, okay, you have, we have a movement tradition that we've inherited from another place, primarily from Latin America. Um, that would be like our neighbor doing that work. And until recently, we didn't live through a coup. We didn't live through these other things that necessitated collective response and like, and, uh, not even necessitated it, but like, it's not, it's just a different, not in our organizing culture. We organize in like other kinds of ways, right? Like we right. don't uh, we don't do solidarity economy forums like you do in Brazil. We just right. don't have that, right? And so there's a reason for why we don't have that. It's historical and it's spatial. I mean, um, it's really so interesting. I mean, being in New York City and trying to create a solidarity economy, I feel like you know, uh, I mean, I don't mean it as a diss at all, but like. Um, but you know, in, in some ways, I think it was like the capital of the global financial empire. Like you're, you're in, you're at the sort of center in some ways of these capital flows that are extracting resources from all over the world, and that and the people who serve serve that and directly sort of maintain that are, are in some ways the sort of top tier of the people in the society, and then sort of everything else is sort of built around serving those people's needs at least implicitly in some way but then people are just living their lives and and providing for their families and mm -hmm. and and there's a whole obviously the majority of people are not directly involved in that at all but how does that how how do you find that that um sort of affects the culture or um mm -hmm. or or the 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 organizing i mean because you said i mean i guess i thought of that when you said you know more economy and less solidarity um do you, do you feel like that's trickling down culturally or or in terms of movement practices or is there something else going on um and i want i want to be kind of like more narrow with that and say like it's it's not the organizing culture of the city writ large because if we look to uh let's say like abolitionist organizing or other kinds of mutual aid networking mm -hmm. or anarchist sure. organizing it's a city of such deep organizing traditions where people were meeting our needs together but they again but the solidarity economy if we were to clock it when it's in our city is really recent it's 2009 and a lot of that is building enterprises building firms um yeah so that's what i would say it, it, it impacts the culture in that way but it's it's not written in stone either and what i found in my work was for the practitioners i spoke to the importance of their work like the thrust of their work was much more relational than we give credit for so actually the people laboring under it the rank and file collective workers are thinking relationally and because they're thinking relationally much more people are included in let's say like the big tent of solidarity economy work than these models, right? They're thinking of their family or they're thinking of their like shared migrant community. They're thinking of people that are doing the same kinds of work, but are not uh, cooperative. Like, you know, you're thinking of your industry or something. So in a way it like kind of busted down that typical wheel of like, this is what the solidarity economy is to become actually more relational. I was just gonna say, it's like, that's 
but the, the, all the relationships that don't show up on that org chart that that we love to sort of show at these workshops and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because think if you were to present something like, oh, you want to be engaged in solidarity economy? Here's this wheel. And it's like, well, I don't want to start a business and I don't want to like run a thing. I never, me, Lauren Hudson, I never want to start a business. I would just, it would drive me crazy <laughs> and I just don't have the temperament. But yeah. I know that there's this place in this movement for me. I'm attracted to it for some reason. So what is, what is, what is the but there there and it turns out that's like reflected in the comments from my practitioners it's like well yeah i do collective work but i it's much more grounded in this other kind of relational principle or the way that i want to understand family in the future or like mm -hmm. kinship networks and all this other stuff too so that's really yeah. encouraging to me <laughs> I, I know i'd like love to hear a little more about about that and specifically fam family and kinship networks and how what what's the interplay between sort of cooperative structures and values uh, and how people are seeing the family i would say that the collective work is a way to redistribute the burdens that are usually felt exclusively to your family like inside your home mm -hmm. it's our responsibility is like partners with a child or something like that and brackets it out and pushes it into more like public space. And this has been like a terrain that feminist geographers have studied since feminist geography, right? Um, you know, removing the kitchen from your household and into the public square or something like that. How does that not only change, you know, your labor relation, but your gender relation within the home too? So you're, when we talk about sharing risks, it's often involving some kind of shared or public space there. So people are, people are thinking about like, how do I make a family system that is less violent? Mm -hmm. um, like, so some people do that by making other families, right? And so like, I'm, mine's gonna be different. And some people do that by doing that and doing collective work. And some people do that by doing collective work because uh, it's another way of, of sharing risk and responsibility for social reproduction. So are you talking about like uh, collective kitchens or community? food production or like what, what, what is that is that what you're referring to yeah all of the above from collective housing so like sure, again legally recognized collective housing or uh, interpersonally recognized collective housing to uh community gardens these are other spaces of actual like meeting our needs even if we're not like growing a thing or producing a thing right um yeah i would say it's all of the above it's the things that would we would typically like keep to ourselves in some way and how do those, how, how, I mean, in your research how, or in, in, in terms of the, the practitioners that you talk to, how do those affect, how do those sort of shape family life? Um, I don't know, it kind of goes in multiple directions. One thing, and it depends on which model we're talking about. So let's say with um, like cooperative firms, it almost marketizes relationships again. Right, so it could, I try to be like very careful about how they say this. So the the kind of the relationships we want to build has always been like the yardstick by which my practitioners and my respondents were judging their work. Like how well is this a relationship I want to create? So sometimes they would say, okay, in a co-op, I now have all of these new friends. They're integrated into my life. We share responsibilities. They stop over once a week. We share meals. We do these other things. So you're actually just like building a better friendship network that you can rely on in a crisis. And then in other ways, let's say we have um, cooperative firms for different services, the things that we would normally lean on our friends for, we're now putting in a market relationship, even if it's a cooperative one too, right? So it's like, oh, where I'm from, where we have more developed kinship networks as people stay in place longer, we would never think to hire someone to do this. But now it's on the table in, in the, <laughs> the market generally. So I guess I'll pick the cooperative version of that and it's better, but this would never be even be a question. It wouldn't be a service in the same way, that a service that you would pay for. It'd be a service that you replicate among your group too. So I don't want to paint too rosy the picture that it completely undoes the subjectivity because there are many ways, depending on the, the model we're talking about, that it still repeats that, which is kind of what we were saying about Park Slope. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like whack-a-mole in some ways. You're like, all right, you know, you, <laughs> we 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 decommodified this thing over here, and, uh, you know. Yeah, right, right. It's like, well, if it has to be commodified, let's make sure that it's commodified this way. Just like the things we're talking about with them, or that we've seen like make, making cooperative like food delivery services or cooperative like 
taxis or all these other kinds of services too. We're, we're collectivizing fringe freelance work. And so that puts workers in an arguably better position than their non-cooperative peers. But then we have this larger question to call of like broader insecurity and do we want to pay for everything or I don't know. I mean, it sounds like we're also sort of under the time and money pressure, like which is increasing, it seems, um, you know, year year over year uh, of capitalism. But then, but we also want mutual aid, but but we don't have the sort of free time to be able to to create the free time or or the ability to be in, like as you said in the same place for long enough to develop the sort of cultural practices of community life or communal life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So. Yeah, we just have to build in all directions simultaneously in this way. We have to secure our ability mm -hmm. to stay in place longer so that these possibilities seem more real or on the table um, in a way that they are in other places. That's why I was saying like there's a culture to this, but that culture is informed by like the actual political economy and the geography of the place where you're organizing. That defines what you consider possible. It defines your horizon and the kind of questions that you ask too. So New Yorkers are working with a certain set of questions because of gentrification as just one example, right? Um, that others who have been in the same, you know, neighborhood for their entire lives and are able to do that even just like other parts of the states but also other parts of the world develop their own kind of organizing traditions and possibilities out of that reality. I'm, I'm curious about gentrification. I mean I, I would imagine that in you know housing co-ops for example are um, you know I think often sort of seen as ways of sort of like stemming the tide of, of sort of hyper commodification and speculation about housing but I imagine that's also can also be complex in terms of the effects on neighborhoods but I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. what you're seeing there in, yeah. in, in, a, in such a hotbed like and and you know NYC yeah I mean we we're lucky to have the the cops that we have we have many and they uh housing is just such a can of worms because again um there are those, most people are just like average people in, you know, low income cooperative housing and it's fine. And it doesn't upend their uh, sense of, sense of self in relations to, it doesn't, it maybe not, never challenges that relationship about decommodified housing. And there's others that do, like if we're looking at like the CLT movement, which is de decommodification of land for affordable housing. Um, so those Community are different land trusts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So uh, Amanda Huron is another geographer and researcher that has uh, researched HCFC co-ops actually in DC. And she brings up this tension as well, which is if we're telling low-income people that they should accept decommodified housing and it's a radical way to be, we're also telling closing off a form of wealth building to people that have been exclusive, like, you know, exclusively closed off from that process from redlining and beyond and before, right? So how is that fair or okay? If I were someone else that was not, you know, interested in collective work, I'd be like, this is a scam. So everyone else gets private housing and they get to pass it on to their kids, but I don't for some greater good. So there's, how do you incentivize shared risk for the long-term when, you know, we already live in a cultural context of commodified housing now? Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I feel like uh, maybe maybe this isn't quite matching up, but but I feel like often, I mean, certainly in Quebec, this is the case, but that the co-ops end up sort of being used to address the sort of extreme margins where there's not a lot of profit to be made mm -hmm. um, or where people have been like so marginalized uh, that that you just need to sort of like keep them functional. Uh, and so because co-ops are so efficient and 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 really make a much fuller use of people's I don't know solidarity and caring and everything, they're actually like a really cheap way for the government to address mm -hmm. social problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so you end up with a sort of you know neoliberal form of cooper cooperation basically where you say okay well great you you guys want to do co-ops or create a solidarity economy great go do it over here in this mm -hmm. place that's like totally <laughs> economically you know distressed uh and and we'll we will take the high margin 
um, you know, profitable industries, thank you very much. And we'll keep mm -hmm. that for ourselves, but we'll give you a little bit to like, keep this thing going over here. Exactly. Yeah. The whole like cut rate welfare state for poor people through cooperation. And like, what does that do culturally down the road when people are like, oh, I want to go to the co-op version. That one's bad or something like that. Um, how does that take part in like a further delegitimizing of the model over time? I think that was my big like tinfoil hat conspiracy theory in 2014, honestly. It was like, we're going to get all this money and it's so narrow and the way that we disperse is so hard. And you know, getting money from the city, even when it's earmarked for you, you're doing all this labor up front and hoping to pay yourself back at like the end of the fiscal year. And it's just so messed up that we're gonna see, and we're incentivized in our reporting to say like, we, you know, launched 40 co-ops and 30 like entrepreneurs created out of this. And I don't know who's doing the work about how many of those have stopped shuttered <laughs> after that year. I don't know where that lives. Um, hard to find right. so uh yeah i don't know what i so far i feel like it's so small that it that it isn't called creating this like wake of you know this model doesn't work and it's bad um but it's a thing to keep track of my so my conspiracy is like this is just a way for them for this model doesn't work because it's not supported in the ways it needs to be supported over time investing in we do have like technical systems and education in that sense, but investing in solidarity is so intangible and weird. And honestly, so few of us are trained in that and are still not good at it. That like where, where, how would that operate? And it's not in the state's interest to fund yeah. that anyway. So that's definitely one of the things that we've been trying to respond to, you know, in some of the co-op or the solidarity economy, socialist economy organizing here in Montreal is like seeing that like, yeah, you can create a lot of co-ops and people like to create co-ops, but but if you don't have that sort of bigger, if you don't have a bigger base of people and, and community support that that is going, that is all on the same page and not just approaching it as, oh, I, I go here because it's cheaper to buy my groceries or whatever, but they're actually understanding that there's value in democratic control of value mm -hmm. chains and so on. Um, like if you don't have that that sort of social and cultural fabric and infrastructure in place, then, then you just end up running like, um, you know, businesses that are a little bit better than other businesses is, is sort of your best case scenario. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I guess I'm just curious sort of how you, I mean, I, I know you've, our response, I guess, was to do a lot of education work and be like, okay, let's create an eight week program that really like lays out all the different parts of the solidarity economy and says like, hey, if you're a public sector worker, uh, if you're a, some, an entrepreneur, if you're a, um, just you know, a person who's an activist, if you're uh, somebody who lives in a housing, co if, you're, if, if, if you're any number of things, not necessarily even a co member of a co-op, th then there's still a way for you to participate in transforming the economy in a long-term way in a, in a relationship building and, and cultural transformation mm -hmm. that, that is, you know, that creates the possibility of economic transformation kind of way, um, you know, and, and, you know, obviously that's, that's early days, but, but I know you've done a lot of education work with, with Scenic um, and, and, and trying to sort of, it, it sounds like do something similar in terms of um, generating that social fabric and that knowledge and that sh those the th that alignment, I guess, um, you know, not not just in the entrepreneurial cooperative world, but but beyond. Uh, it, um, I guess <laughs> I guess my question is, tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah. Um... There is a, all our our hurdle is a little bit smaller because you already have buy in. These are already our members or people that would have been seeking out scenic in some kind of way anyway. Mm -hmm. um, or we're we're obviously like reaching out to uh, spaces that would like qualify under this banner. But there's there's an agreement of a crisis and a kind of work there. And so then, who we're working with are people that have the desire to deepen that relationship or honestly just process things together that are beyond the business like bottom line. And a lot of times that comes up too. It's like, hey, how are you guys doing your taxes? <laughs> um, and that's like very funny because uh, I've noticed like in maybe the three or four years of doing these trainings that that is a thing that comes up. And I'm like, you technically have your sectoral network for that. But 
uh, there's a value in like a gardener asking a worker owner or something like that. Um, but so, so much of our, you know, facilitation work is geared towards the like, understanding the different roles that different people play in a collective work and also managing um, conflict too. And people are like so hungry for that. Like those conversations could go on forever, right? And also hungry for just like unstructured time to be together. And so we always have to like fight. We, again, generally fight the impulse that every kind of like training space has to have some like declarative like outcome of it where now people know how to like balance their books better or have gone through these conflict resolution steps together and they have, but there again, there's that intangible value of just being together as well. And so one of the things that I know Scenic as an organization has been balancing is like, how do we manage the social fabric of those cohorts that we've graduated over time together and make sure that they're in contact with one another. So we've experienced like uh, in the early times, like a reading group or some kind of shared listserv or something like that. But then as the shared actual physical space like gets further and further away, it's, you might find, and this isn't my direct experience because I'm not in touch with the cohorts so much as like groups of people, um, what are again the external incentives to maintain that collective space again, right? So, uh, or over time too, you'll still run into that same issue. Um, so yeah, I know that's one of the things that's been weighing, but it's as far as our work together in that like six week intensive that we're together, it's extremely generative at all these different scales. People are processing like what it is to run a thing. And then also like, oh my God, this interpersonal crazy shit happened to me and this thing and like, how do you guys deal with this kind of thing as well? And that a lot of our education is also about like actual physical regulation of stress too, which you don't get a lot of the time. Sometimes it's a little bit too wooey for me. I personally don't have that interiority, but I'm very grateful to my co-facilitators <laughs> facilitators who do and can do that. And that seems to be um, a place where we get a lot of good response as well. Uh -huh. And what about the sort of a shared vision or a feeling of building a, a greater capacity as a movement or identify, I guess, seeing yourself as part of a movement is, do you, do you see any sort of particular results in terms of your, I don't know, cohorts, graduates? That ranges. It's still probably like my largest question mark as like an organizer and then as a person in that space too, because it, it truly depends on how you frame movement work. So solidarity economy is a kind of a weird movement because it's, it as of yet in the States doesn't make explicit demands of the state. It doesn't have a theory of the state that it operationalizes anyway. It's about creating an economic reality. So that immediately then guides us to how do we create more and better collective things um, and just like fill up the economic space with these things, right? right? So then in that cohort, you'll see like, okay, um, the demands are asked in terms of collective consciousness is like building more things or building better things. And so it's again, like operationalizing training information to like, you know, create stronger things. And I'm part of that too. Oh, I want these things to be better and for the long term as well. And like, um, so yeah, I, I, this has been like my thing that I scream at all the time. It's like, I wonder what exists, like, why haven't we generally marshaled the energy that we have in a way that uses more direct, like class-based language. Like we don't say solidarity economy is like a working class movement, for instance. We like really err away from like hmm. the capital L labor literature that we have in the States, which is very deep and broad and cool and big. We don't like fold it into that. And I wonder why that is. And I don't have an answer for it already. But I guess you could ask the same thing of unions as to why there's like, <laughs> where the political thrust has gone within them or the solidarity thrust has gone within those as well beyond demands and contracts and things too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I feel like I'm always sort of thinking at least in the back of my head, like I want the public sector and like to be more like cooperatives in the sense that it's more responsive and more dem like community rooted and democratic and, and relationally organic. 
and I want cooperatives to be more like the public sector <laughs> in the sense that I want them to be, I want them to be like systematic, ubiquitous, like, you know, large scale and, and um, heavily subsidized. <laughs> exactly, um, right. But, but uh, I mean, that's just sort of an aside, but, uh, but, uh, but you mentioned the sort of a theory of the state and I'm curious if, you know, not to ask the $64,000 question, but, 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 but what's, what, ha coming as somebody who's really, grounded in all these conversations with all these practitioners in a super practical way like um i guess you know not like what is your theory of the state because volume one obviously but um but uh but more like you know how does that affect how you how you see things on a on a kind of a larger political scale uh mm -hmm. yeah in terms of the possibilities for transformation i mean it makes me personally anxious that we've like aired away from that work, you know, so for me personally, I'm like, ah, why, I, why, why don't we talk about it? Or, and then I feel like silly. I'm like, maybe I missed something like, and we settled this question in some way. Um, or maybe, uh, yeah, just thinking maybe I missed <laughs> something generally. I, the, if we were just pulling from like the responses from people that I spoke with, it is again all over the place and a solidarity economy is seen as part of other coexisting like political homes. So you have people that are like, I use a solidarity economy framework, but I use it in this like, my larger training as an anarchist, which has its theory of the state or, um, didn't speak to too many communists, but, or self-named. Um, so, yeah, it'll, it fits in this kind of wheel of options and they're not contradictory because how many times do we really think my like Lauren Hudson's personal theory of the state and what are the things that I do that are in contradiction that no one does that. And that's like rude almost to ask for someone to do it, um, to like perform in that way. So yeah, the, it's the biggest open question. And I think that so far, again, because we had this, there's like moneyed interest or like the state's kicking us a few million every few years to build certain models, you know, like uh, all of it, not ones that ultimately challenge its supremacy, but certain things. Um, then our conversation, our relationship with the state has then been, how do we get more money in better ways? Or how do we get this in like smarter ways that actually like channel it to the work that we wanna channel it to? Um, so it again is very like material and narrow and almost like pragmatic questions mm -hmm. in that way in in the places where it has shown that or it's framed in a historical sense the state abandoned its social welfare roles so we created collective institutions to fill that and now we have them and it's so great that we have them or now we have them and these are the challenges of having them if we look at our community garden history that's like and our yeah. housing co-op history that's where we see that yeah i mean i feel like the question that would immediately spring to mind as somebody with obviously no local context but it's just like how do you how do you channel the resources of the state into creating capacity that can give you the ability to act independent of its interests and not be shaped and be shaped by it as little as possible and and instead be shaped by the needs of communities and the mm -hmm. and the actual values that that you're building as a movement mm -hmm. um, and i guess yeah like is that a question that that comes up um not probably like uh, in more proximate ways like between people and also that's like a very particular class of people like it's man maybe management level developer level people that are like managing this money all the time it probably right. comes up there um and and i would say like people that are maybe not like rank and file gardeners let's right. say but organizers that are like making the conferences and writing the literature probably comes up in those classes as well that's where mm -hmm. I when it was raised that's where I saw it raised um I think we're at such a place in New York where we're just so jealous of everything else <laughs> we're obviously very proud of our like our organizing history and um you know we especially like solidarity economy people um in the states would like look to brazil or something be like oh my gosh they had these big forums and then it became part of this big state project and it's supported and it's acknowledged and it's like culturally recognized and affirmed in this way and then you have the literature from brazil saying like okay so this is what happened <laughs> it was wrapped in and then it yeah. changed our dynamics to one another where we now like 
uh, there's less horizontalness, even though it exists, it's marketized yeah. or, or we're like going to state for the things that we want. And maybe that's not bad, but it is a change in relationship. And it's so hard to try and emphasize that that is coming down the pike like 25 years from now and right. to like say like, we should be thinking about this now when it's like, we are so starved <laughs> and we would just like this, these businesses to exist next year. Um, I feel like I prioritize that. I feel like I really have that experience, like, or that, that sort of funny disjuncture when, when Solidarity NYC came to Montreal Mm -hmm. to visit Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of you were like, oh, we know, talk to Chantier. We want to talk to these big and like big multi kajillion dollar institutions that are like managing the solidarity economy. And I'm like, you guys are doing like the most amazing movement building stuff. And we don't have any of that here because it all gets hoovered up, like sucked up into this um into this giant you know and you know kind of nonprofit industrial complex type Mm -hmm. uh infrastructure and you and nothing happens on the very little happens on the grassroots because there's all this funding but it's but the funding is shaping things all the time and 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 sanding off the edges whereas Mm -hmm. like you know you actually have like a, a really vital grassroots movement that's that's having these conversations at a at a in a different kind of way and having conversations about transformation in a different kind of way as opposed to like having conversations about oh we had a successful co-op and it made you know made a bunch of money and did some nice things and here's our powerpoint you know yeah the kind of thing that you see more up here i mean in these like in these like big you know solidarity economy cooperative conferences that happen at the like biggest hotel in town and have the president of like a multi-billion dollar bank that's a technically a cooperative get up and be like capitalism right. isn't working and then like well, what does that mean i you know it's it's it's, yeah, it's confusing <laughs> but um but but anyway it's just funny because like i feel like as somebody in montreal like i want i want what you have you know yeah <laughs> but, yeah. yeah it's all all relative i i i how you want to get the money and you want to keep the analysis, but what are the in, uh, internal and external incentives to keeping the analysis? Um, and I don't know what kind of forum where we have that discussion and get on the same page about it. It's, it could be a conference. I don't find that like terribly thrilling, but um, where we shake out our theory of the state and our theory of revolution, should we, should we so desire? Because Truthfully, it might be enough that we just have all of these institutions. It might be enough for people in them. And that's where we get to the parts of thing, right? Um, and I know I don't mean to scarecrow them too much, but they're the biggest and they're here. So I, I will. Um, it might be enough that you have, you do your shift and you make friends on your shift and that's like a great cherry on top. And you have access to cheaper produce and cheaper groceries. And it was open during the pandemic, but it's not enough for people that are part of that membership cohort that do not have access to that for a number of different reasons. Um, So it's fine in good times, but then in real deep crises like the ones we're seeing now, that solidarity matters um, because it, it's, it shapes who you see as part of your political and, um, and social community and who you stick your neck out for. So the fact that we didn't create or see it as ne- necessary from the jump to organize people in some way and we didn't look at our list and say, oh my God, 20,000 people, we could sort this. Um, we could hire someone and invest in that time and do that. It's not that it's almost for me, not that we didn't do it. It's that we didn't find it socially, politically or materially necessary to do it. And so we're, by doing that, create implying that there's a kind of class that we can let go. And of course it's obviously like ageist and it's ableist too. And so for as much as people want to be like, oh, not everything is wooly and whatever, there are material outcomes for not investing in solidarity. And this is yeah, what we're living with now. There are definitely, definitely some disconnects and breaks in the web of solidarity, it sounds mm-hmm. like. I mean, obviously there are everywhere. It's, it's, uh, it's inevitable, but it's our, I guess it's our job as, you know, the, 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 the sort of self-reflective actors to address yeah. those. So, um, yeah, I, I guess as a sort of a sec- penultimate question, um, kind of what do you see on the immediate horizon for 
from your perspective as a as a you know feminist researcher recent phd grad new uh you know or you know organizer of of cooperatives at the, the sort of cross sectoral level but also with solidarity nyc like what 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 do you see sort of happening in the next couple of years oh yeah. or, uh, or what's 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 a con what are what are your con concerns or what are you sort of uh, anticipating so within Solidarity may see we've been kind of in this hibernation period for a long time and we are like now revving up to do more like different kinds of public facing work um i think that the advantageous position that we have is that we aren't selling anything and we were never paid so we can just like be assholes <laughs> like lovable assholes in this way where like no one's gonna cut us off because it's like we're paying for our web hosting um ourselves so that being said we've we've really taken the opportunity to like suss out the questions that like you and i have discussed and um one of the cues that we have taken is like, how do we better define what a solidarity economy is so that it, so that you can't, so there's no more like slippage in the term. And one of the things we were really inspired by was after the uprisings in June, you had a lot of reformist platforms propping up about like how to reshape and redefine the police under a reformist model. And because you'd had this like long time organizing and disciplinary tradition of abolition, there was this really great response to that that could operate, like that could, spring in like a week that was saying like nope this isn't what this is we have done this work the cities where they have these policies still have obviously like extrajudicial killings from cops and not have all this violence look at all this stuff and it was i i that's the thing that i get personally jealous of that is like there is no equal solidarity kind of response yet we do a lot of writing we do a lot of trainings we do a lot of stuff a lot of it is out there but there's still the possibility of that like term being eroded to just being like friendlier softer capitalism kinder capitalism or rather than killing your boss everyone's a boss those are different asks <laughs> um it's like uh, and those are different subject positions and so how do we be very protective of the subject position uh, positions we want to create that seems to be where our like collective energy and questions are moving into now so yeah that's what i would say <laughs> That sounds really exciting. Um, really looking forward to seeing what comes out of uh, your organizing. Um, so yeah, Lauren Hudson, thank you so much for coming on Half Past Capitalism. Um, is there anything you want to uh, plug or do you, oh is there any place we can find you online or your projects online? Oh, wow. Okay, so my Twitter, I think that's the only thing I have is Blacktivist. It's B L A C. T-I-V-I-S-T. -I -I and that's where you can find me, but it's really just me talking about TV. So unfortunately I don't have a good professional public facing <laughs> presence. So if you're into that, that's where that is. And I think that the other thing, the directions I would point people towards is when we didn't talk about neighborhood-based mutual aid or other kinds of mutual aid that exists, but we're in a very like fertile and rich environment right now. And I would encourage people to think about how you can build solidarity out of, in very proximate ways with your neighbors or even the people in your building or something like that. So this thing, you don't have to start a business to like live these principles at all. <laughs>